to tell my kids here at Over Lake, we take Jesus very seriously. We don't take ourselves that seriously. We, we, we're able to laugh at ourselves and with each other. And so, Royce, great job. Um, and the video also serves, yeah, we, I'm always up for cheering for Royce. Honestly, it's so great. Yeah, he's such a gift to our community on so many levels. Um, I want to remind us, this, the part of the point of that video is it kind of reorients us back to like, where are we headed? What, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to be in today? And so I just, I know it's silly and maybe a little awkward, but it does the job. It helps us, right? Um, now, again, if I haven't met you, my name is Neely. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here. The other co-lead pastor is currently on sabbatical. He'll be back in a couple weeks. But we are in week three of our Romans series, season two. And we saw, again, in this video, which was so helpful, as awkward as, awkward as it was, was so helpful, that it helped us see this overarching theme of Romans, which is this, that the good news is for everyone everywhere. That's, that's it. That's the overarching theme of Romans. And, and you saw in this video that it said, it said that freedom was a big part of that, right? That freedom played a significant role in the good news for everyone everywhere. Now, last week, we had the distinguished professor, Dr. J.P. O'Connor, which was, I, uh, I wanted to actually learn what his whole name was so I could say it. I want to say it's James Patrick, but I think that's actually wrong. It's just a very Irish name. Um, I'm actually, should I switch to handheld? Because I hear myself. Should I switch to handheld? Anyone? I'm okay? Okay. Yes. No. I'm just going to, someone can bring it to me if they, if they think I should. Um, <laughs> so good, so the good news is tied into freedom. And so when JP last week talked about this idea that sl- sin has enslaved us, what that means, it kind of helps the clarity of freedom being part of the good news become clearer, right? Those, if you're enslaved to something, freedom is obviously essential for good news. So we're going to jump into chapter 7 today, and I want to tell you that chapter 7 is a challenging chapter. Um, It's a hard one. And I'm going to, let me pull back the curtain a little bit for you. When I sit down to begin writing a message for Sunday, many of you come to mind. Your faces, the stories, the particular joys and pain in your life in this moment. Um, I know in this space, we have all kinds of stories, whether it's in this room or online, and we're, we're all holding multiple things. So as I write a message, my hope every time I write a message is that the Word of God becomes alive to us, that it encourages us, that it helps us, that it inspires us to live in the world in a particular way. And, and so... Seven was hard. It was a challenging one for me. Uh, And you know what? Challenge is good. That's what I'm learning is that the wrestling, it's in the wrestling that really beautiful stuff comes out. One thing I've heard people say, in fact, uh, a gentleman said it to me this morning. He said, the Bible is clear. And I think that's true um, on certain things. Yes, love your neighbor. From start to finish, the Bible is very clear about that message. And then there are whole other parts of Scripture that require us to wrestle with them, to dig out context. And even after we do all that, we still are kind of left with uh, a certain uncertainty. And that is actually the beauty of the text, that the Holy Spirit is alive and moving and and the text comes alive in this particular moment and begins to breathe. And so is the Bible always clear? No, no. And I have to tell you, I love God's word. I love scripture. My desire to, to learn and wrestle with scripture came from my dad. I love my dad. He's great. Um, I saw him yesterday, but here he is walking me down the aisle. Um, I grew up watching, oh, yeah, Al, wherever you're at, um, we're cheering for you. He's actually very funny. Um, 
I, I wanted to change the photo last minute because he was at my kid's grad's party yesterday and he was working the room, cornering people, telling them stories. I was like, okay, all right, Al, move along. But I love my dad. He, he's such a gift. It, I watched my dad read through the Bible every year in a different translation every year. Every year, I'd, walk, I'd wake up and I'd see him reading through scripture and his love for scripture. But you know what my dad taught me about scripture? That it was okay to wrestle with scripture. My dad also taught me that it's okay to disagree with people about scripture, which is, I, you know, my dad and I, I love him. We, we are so alike and we do not see eye to eye on a lot of things within scripture. We don't see eye to eye. So we love to, we love to have a healthy discourse on it, as I like to say. Um, I remember the first time my husband Josh came and hung out with us. My dad and I started arguing over a passage in scripture. And my dad and I, we just go. We're French and Irish, which I think is probably a pretty explosive combination. And, uh, and we just are arguing. I mean, Josh has his hand on my leg, like, you know, it's all going to be fine, you know, and I'm like, we're like just going for it. My dad and I are just, and then we, we re, the end, and we're like, oh my gosh, remember that one time? I mean, we switched conversations back to like nothing just happened, and Josh was like, wait, you still like each other? I'm like, yes, we love each other. I mean, my dad has been such a gift in helping me love the text, wrestle with the text, and love people who disagree with me on the text. I mean, that is the gift of Altrudo. So I want to say that my dad prepared me for chapter seven of Romans. I mean, it was my dad's work that made this ready today. And so uh, what I want to tell us and help direct us as we dive into chapter seven, a key factor is for us to remember that, that Romans is not a book in the Bible. Yes, I'm not that, it is a book in the Bible, but it is a letter written that has been placed into the Bible. And it was a letter written to particular people living in a particular world, using particular language, wrestling with particular issues. And so then it's helpful knowing that for us to embrace the particularities of the text. That is the work we need to do. And so that's kind of what we're going to do today as we dive into chapter 7. But before we do, let's, let's begin with prayer. Jesus, thank you for who you are, that you are the God who gives us freedom who liberates us, who offers us life and life to the fullest. May Romans 7, as we wrestle with what, what we discover, may it bring life and liberation to us and our world today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're going to start very first verse of chapter 7, verse 1. This is what Paul writes. Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Now we're going to stop right there, because this is a sentence I want us to see. It gives away right away. He's writing to a particular people, the people who know the law. And this really is the context for chapter 7. What is the law? Now, a reminder, he's writing to a multi-ethnic congregation made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And when Paul is saying the law, he's not talking about the Roman law, the governing law. He's talking about the Torah. The Torah, or the first five books of Hebrew scripture, the Jewish text. M more particularly, what Paul's going to talk about in Romans 7 is the law, um, the Ten Commandments, the, the, these particular Ten Commandments. And the people of God at that time called the commandments the Ten Words. They were the Ten Words. And these ten words were given to the people of God right after they've been freed from slavery in Pharaoh's uh, Egypt. And they had just been uh, rescued from God, out of, liberated out of slavery. And God gives them these ten words. And the, the purpose of these ten words is to live in relationship with God and with each other. Now, I want, I want to be very clear because I think we hear law and we have a, a misunderstanding of it. These 10 words were meant for life and flourishing and blessing, individually and collectively. That's how the law was understood. So uh, you'll notice this graphic behind me. We've got the 10 commandments here. And I want you to notice 
the first three, let's see what they, you shall have no other God before me, you shall not make idols, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. This is about our relationship with God. This is about the flourishing of our connection to God. The fourth one is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, as I've heard this and learned it from others, is that this is about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other, the Sabbath. The remaining six are about our relationship with each other. Honor your mother and father. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. These are about community. You could say that the law is made up of loving God and loving people. Uh, Some say that you could sum up the entirety of the law in loving God and loving your neighbor. And when I say some say, Jesus said. Like that's what Jesus actually said. He said to love God and love your neighbor is to fulfill the entirety of the law. So again, the law here is a gift. It is meant for life. It is meant for the people of God to have a way to experience the fullness of life, the goodness of life, of good and right relationship with God and with each other for goodness. And multiple times God says to Israel, he says, when you follow the law, you will know life. You'll know life. And he also says, when you disobey the law, you'll experience destruction, death. Now, we could spend a long time talking about, are those consequences that just happen? Are they uh, put on? Or is this really just when we follow these, we experiencing the flourishing of life? And when we don't, we don't experience flourishing. So, and if you read the whole of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scripture, you'll see this happens over and over. This comes to fruition where the people of God flourish and where they don't flourish. So here's Paul saying, to the people who know the law, to the people who know the law. And I think there's two goals in, the, in chapter 7 for Paul with the law. And the first one is this, that Paul wants to continue to demonstrate how powerful and how destructive sin is in the world. Right? Remember in chapter 5, we talked about how sin entered the world through one man. How it entered the world and led to um, destruction for all. So that was chapter 5. Chapter 6, JP talked about this idea that sin is so powerful that it enslaves people, that it turns humanity into instruments and weapons of unrighteousness, right? This is what we saw in 5 and 6. In 7, Paul is going to keep on going, and he's going to say sin is so powerful, so powerful and so bent on destroying everything good, everything beautiful in this world, that even the things that are meant for our life and for flourishing and for goodness, sin is bent on destroying them too. So the goal really is like for us to really understand this good news that Paul has been already writing about and is going to write about much more in chapter 8, He wants us to understand just how bad it is. Just how destructive sin has been in the world. How powerful it has been in the world and within humans. And and if you're going to know how good the good news is for everyone everywhere, how you're going to know that the good news impacts and saves the cosmos, you have to understand the depth of how bad sin is. The second thing that Paul's doing in chapter seven is he's setting up chapter eight, which again, I've already said this, chapter eight is my fave. Can't wait, very excited. Wished I could have skipped seven this week, honestly, and just got to eight. Seven is challenging, but he's building towards something towards the promise of the good news, towards the power of Jesus, towards us fully comprehending the power of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We have to know how powerful sin and evil is in this world. So seven is going to be a bit of a cliffhanger. 
It's going to be a to be continued. You're definitely going to want to be here next week. But with that in mind, let's read from 7. We're going to pick up in verse 4. Again, Paul is talking about the law. I, I take that back. We're going to start in verse 5. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What should we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetedness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and, thro- and though it killed me, and, th- and through it killed me, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Amen. The word of the Lord. Now, if that felt confusing, don't worry. Uh, one of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright, favorite New Testament scholars, N.T. Wright, who also happens to be one of the most well-known New Testament scholars, most highly regarded, said of chapter 7, he's a British uh, Anglican uh, archbishop, so you've got to imagine his accent. He says, chapter 7 has proved to be difficult to understand. Um, in the 80s Valley Girl, it's like, it's really hard, okay? So, um, so if you felt that was confusing, you are not alone. Uh, again, chapters 5 through 8, sin is this major character, right? I'm going to use our graphic once more because it's so great. Uh, um, we see in this season that sin is peak, that 5, 6, and 7, sin shows up. And in a sense, sin is showing up like a main character, and, and I think it might actually be helpful for us to imagine sin capitalized. It, it's showing up as the enemy. In chapter 5, we remember that we were talking about the creation story. And in the creation story, God creates a perfect, beautiful, good world for the flourishing of humankind. And sin enters and destroys it. And it leads to destruction. And then what we see here in chapter 7 is we're fast-forwarding through Israel's history. It started in the garden, and now we are at this point where the law comes. The Torah comes. And the point of the law was human flourishing, was goodness, was life. And what does sin do? Paul says in chapter 7, I love this sentence, sin seized an opportunity to take something meant for life, meant for flourishing, and twist it in a way, distort it in a way that leads to death and destruction. Paul says it seizes that the law was good, just, and sin seized an opportunity to take it and lead it towards death. A scholar, a Romans and Paul scholar, Beverly Roberts Gaventa says this, Romans 7 is neither the law nor the I, Paul says I a lot in this passage, but the way in which sin's power can reach into and even use the holy and good, right and good law of God. So Paul's doing something here that he does a lot in his letters. He's reminding us He's pulling the readers in and he's saying there's a power at work in the world that seeks to destroy. In another letter, in Ephesians 6, Paul says this. He's he's warning them. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against, I love this sentence, the wiles of the devil. 
For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of, of evil in the heavenly places. So Paul, again, this is kind of a theme of Paul. He, he, he's redirecting us that our enemy is not humans, not one another, that there is actually a cosmic power of darkness. In Romans 7, he's calling it sin. In Ephesians, he's, he's calling it the wiles of the devil, the darkness, that there is a force in the world. And I want us to know, it's important. I think Paul is trying to elevate us to like, don't underestimate the power of sin because sin is, is bent on destroying God's perfect creation. Sin is bent on taking a beautiful law meant for human flourishing and destroying that. Sin is bent on in destroying humans. That, that's what Paul is saying. He's like, we have to be mindful that the sin it kills, stills, and destroys. Remember, in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says this, I have come that you might have life and life to the fullest. What he's referencing there is he's referencing creation. That creation story was life and life to the fullest. That's what the law was for. That they might have life and life to the fullest. But what does Jesus say? I have come that you might have life and life to the fullest. But sin, the enemy, comes to kill, still, and destroy. The law was meant to bring life. Sin brings death. The reality Paul's going for here is that that which is good and beautiful in this world can be so easily destroyed by sin. And I think you and I know that. I think you and I know that. We, we see it every day. That there are things meant for good and we can see how quickly they can get turned. Let's just do a couple examples. Wine. I think meant for good. For the enjoyment of life. For savoring. I love a good glass of white wine on a hot summer day. Beauty, life, how quickly evil, sin takes something that is meant to be beautiful. We use it in communion, meant to be beautiful, and destroys it and turns it into addiction that destroys people's lives. Amen. That's the power of sin. Okay, so another one, sex. Sex is a great, beautiful, life-affirming gift. God's idea, not ours. Just a reminder. And God takes this gift and gives it to humans as a gift. And what does sin do? Takes that beautiful, life-affirming gift and turns it into a weapon that has destroyed people's lives, that has been used to manipulate people. The statistics of how many men and women have been abused is outrageous. That's the power of sin, to take something so good and destroy it like that. Sin seized an opportunity in sex. Family, what a gift. God's, God's gift to the world to put children with two parents who love them, a structure to care, grandparents, all cousins, this beautiful gift. The very first family in creation story, sin seizes an opportunity to turn brother against brother. You know, I think about the tension we feel on Mother's Day and Father's Day. So many of us have stories of pain and suffering from our, our families, our family trauma. Uh, Father's Day, it happens to be an easier one for me than Mother's Day. I have confessed that there is brokenness between my Mother's Day. I would actually say I celebrate my dad on Mother's Day because in so many ways he mothered me as well. I think about the, there's a popular song right now that says, I'm still angry with my parents for what their parents did to them. A place meant for good, for care. 
is turned into a place of generational sin and trauma that just keeps getting passed on. I mean, sin and evil and the powers and the principalities will take what is good, what is beautiful, what is just, and it will seize an opportunity to lead it to death and destruction. Okay, one more example. Well, I got two more examples. The church. What a beautiful example of God's presence here. A family a place of redemption, God's very presence dwelling with us and through us, that we belong to God and we belong to each other. And on a weekly basis, I hear stories of churches that have abused power, have harmed groups of people with their hate. Our own story at Overlake includes that. A place meant for healing has caused more harm because sin seized an opportunity. If sin can seize an opportunity with the law that God has given, you better believe sin can seize an opportunity to take a place meant for healing and turn it into something else. That's the power of sin. That's what Paul is driving home here. It's this, that sin can take what is intended for life, for goodness, for beauty, human flourishing, and instead use it for death. Let me give one final example, and this one is relevant to this week. This Wednesday is Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day. And Freedom Day is the day that we remember and we celebrate. But Freedom Day actually should be a different day. It should be January 1st, 1863. Uh, that's the day that the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, liberating slaves throughout, those who were enslaved throughout the United States. In fact, the night before that was supposed to happen, um, Booker T. Washington spoke of this. This is what the feeling was in his book, from Up From Slavery. As the great day drew nearer, there was more singing in the slave quarters than usual. It was bolder, had more ring, and lasted later into the night. Most of the verses of the plantation songs had some reference to freedom. True, they had sung those same verses before, but they had been careful to explain that freedom in these songs referred to the next world and had no connection with life in this world. Now they gradually threw off the mask and were not afraid to let it be known that freedom in their song meant freedom of the body in this world. It is powerful, right? The freedom meant for this world. But the reason we don't celebrate it on January 1st is because it would take until June 19, 1865 for that law to be heard, to be enforced throughout the United States, the last place being in Texas. And so what you see here is another tangible example of something meant for good news, for liberation, being distorted by evil. Freedom, meant to, to, to be bared as good news for all, is turned and withheld from some. And we know we've made a lot of progress in the United States since June 19th. But we also know that there's a lot more to be done. Because, again, that is the work. We are at work in this forces of ha- that are happening, powers and principalities. So while June 19th came Freedom Day, we still recognize that though the institution of slavery is gone, that there are new evils and new sins that have seized an opportunity. There is Jim Crow, there is school to prison pipeline, there are systems and structures that kill, still, and destroy. This is the world. Sin and evil and powers and principalities, they take what is good, what is beautiful, what is meant for human flourishing, liberation and freedom, and they turn it into oppression, death, destruction. So this Wednesday, we have an opportunity to live in the both and, the now and not yet. To celebrate Juneteenth is to celebrate the end of institutional slavery. That's, that is worth celebrating. But we also, we make space for the both and, which means we also make space for lament. To name and to grieve and to hold hope and to work towards the ending of racial injustice in the world, in our country. 
This, this is what Paul is going after in chapter 7. What he's saying in this portion of the letter is that we have to be mindful of just how destructive sin is. And so before we get to chapter 8 where, you know, I'm, I would like to just skip there. <laughs> Before we get to the place where we were reminded that God's love is so radical that he would send his only son to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to be resurrected, so that we might experience healing. Again, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but it's coming. Paul's saying, understand the power of sin, of evil in this world. So as I was praying, like, what is it then? Like, what do we do with this news of chapter 7? What do we do with this reality of sin in the world? And I think there's two things we should be doing this week. And I think they pull from Ephesians. They pull from Romans. And this, the first one is this. We got to pay attention to the work of sin that brings death in the world. Paul is saying it's so destructive. Sin is so destructive. And it's multiple times he says, stay alert, stay aware, stand against, see it when it's happening. While we eagerly wait the fullness of God's redemptive work in this world, we are mindful, we're watchful for the way sin can take that which is good, can seize opportunities in the world, seize opportunities in our own life. It, to take those moments that we have to be aware that sin is on the prowl. It wants to lead to violence, to death, to destruction. It wants to kill, steal, and destroy. It wants to counter where God offers full life. It offers death. And we have to be paying attention. We have to be on the lookout. We, we have to be mindful that we have to be able to recognize it, first of all, so that we don't get pulled into it. We we have to be able to name destruction. We have to be able to name the powers and the principalities for what they are. If we can't name them, and you know, I I want to be mindful because I think one of the things Christians are good at doing is naming what's the powers and principalities out there. But we have to be mindful of like, what are the powers and principalities doing in here? Doing in here, doing through us. We need to pay attention. Ephesians 6 says we stand against So in the same breath that we pay attention, we also do this. We live in such a way that brings liberation and life to all. See, following Jesus has never, ever, ever been about simply avoiding sin. It's never been just about avoiding sin in the world. It's been about actively living in a way that brings life that brings liberation, that brings hope to this world. That's the good news. So in Romans 7, when Paul says, sin is seizing an opportunity, what do we do? What do we do? What do you do tomorrow when you show up to work? What's the challenge? What do you do when you go home right now? What do you do when you're driving? In our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, we live as though we believe God is fulfilling all things, making all things new right now. We live as we believe is coming. That's what we do. So here's what we believe. We believe that Jesus brings freedom to everyone everywhere. So what do we do? We join in that work. We believe that God is reconciling all things to each other. So what do we do? We join in that work. We believe that God, Jesus, through Jesus, has torn down the wall of hostility between enemies. So what do we do? We join in that work. We believe that Jesus is healing and restoring all things. So what do we do right now, today? We join in that work. You're like, what? what? Okay, join in. How do I do it? I said it at the beginning. It's a little callback. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And to love them, you got to see them. You got to see them. You got to care about them. You got to know what they're doing, what they're experiencing. You got to know how sin is bringing about destruction in their life so that you can love them, so that you can show up, 
so you can care, so you can bring light and life and love. Love your neighbor. So yes, sin is always trying to seize an opportunity to destroy. The thief is still coming to steal, kill, and destroy. But the good news, the hopeful news, is chapter 8's coming. And Jesus is inviting us to the work of liberation, the work of life, the work of love right now. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Jesus, we want to pay attention. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want to be pulled into the power of sin in this world. So God, we stand against it. We pay attention. And our very act of resistance to the evil in this world is to join you in what you're doing right now life and liberation and love and hope and healing. And so we say, yes, God, we, we join you by loving those around us, loving our neighbors, our coworkers, our family. Guide us. The good news is for everyone everywhere, and we want to be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.